then I may just break your branches off too. He said, don't boast. And then he comes to this word, verse 22, Behold, therefore the goodness and the severity of God. Now the next proof is the goodness of God. Behold, the goodness and the severity of God. Look how severely God punished Israel. He punished them severely. For 2,000 years they've been scattered among the nations. They went through the gas chambers. They've endured untold indignities. They've been scoffed at, made fun of. And yet God still loves them. <coughs> and verse 22 says, On them which fell, severity, that's the Jews, but toward thee, that's the Gentiles, goodness. You see, God has given we Gentiles that goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, I'm afraid that the nation of America has not continued in God's goodness. And the other nations of the world have not continued in God's goodness. And they better get ready to be cut off because just as he cut off Israel temporarily, he's going to cut them off if they don't repent. Otherwise, thou shalt also be cut off. That is, from his goodness. Now, verse 22, reason number 11. God's goodness. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Goodness is mentioned three times in verse 22. God is good. He is good. If thou continue in his goodness. Now verse 25, we have the 12th reason. <coughs> Blindness only in part has happened to Israel. Let me read verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you be wise in your own conceits. That blindness, now watch this word, blindness in part, in part, is happened to Israel. Here's another word you need to watch. Until the fullness of Gentiles be come in. What is God saying here through Paul? He's saying their blindness was only partial. Only partial. He didn't blind the whole nation, all of them. Nationally, yes, but not individually. Many Jews are still being saved. So the blindness was only in part. It was upon those renegades who would not repent of their sins. And then he says, until. What do we use the word until for? Well, it means up to a point. The fullness of the Gentiles become in. And then in verse 27, we have the 13th reason that Israel will never be given up permanently and totally is because of God's covenant. Verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. He's speaking nationally, not of any particular individual. He's talking about Israel as a nation. This is my covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is a fetter, a, a promise, that which binds together. It is a promise, primarily. This is my promise unto them, my covenant unto them. When I shall take away their sins. Is he going to do it? He said he was. I shall take away their sins according to my covenant. Now Moses knew by prophecy that Israel was going to rebel and sin against God and that he was going to punish them, chastise them. Moses predicted that in Deuteronomy 28, 63. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good, and he did, and to multiply you, and he did, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, that is, to chastise you, and to bring you to nothing, 
That is to bring you down on your face. And ye shall be plucked off from the land. The Jews all left the land of Israel. And the Arabs squatted on that land. All that time. Until the Jews came back and took it back over again. He said, ye shall be plucked off from the land. Moses said, I know what God's going to do with you. He's already told me he's going to pluck you off the land. You're going to lose, your, lose the land of Canaan. That's the land that God gave you. You're going to lose it by your sin. To which thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth unto the other. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there, that is among these nations, a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have no assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were evening. And at evening thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. Now that's exactly how the Jews have lived for 2,000 years. In sorrow, in tears, in suffering, in jeering, in persecution. That's how they have lived for 2,000 years because they nailed their Messiah to the cross of Calvary. That's why God is chastising them. Now there's a difference between chastisement and judgment. God has not brought judgment upon them. He's brought chastisement upon them. Now God never brings judgment upon a Christian, but He will bring chastisement upon a Christian if he sins. And this is what Moses prophesied, and for 2,000 years, that's how the Jews have lived. But now they're back in the land. Now they're a nation again. And God's beginning to smile upon them again. And if you've never read Fiddler on the Roof, if you've never seen that movie, Fiddler on the Roof, you ought to buy it today and watch it. I think it's four or five hours long. But you need to see that movie, Fiddler on the Roof. This is a story that starts out with a man with a fiddle up on a roof. And it portrays the suffering of Israel among the nations where they've been scattered. I think it's one of the greatest masterpieces that I've ever seen. I've read a lot about English history and English uh, masterpieces. But this one takes the cake. It stands head and shoulders above them all. And you see graphically portrayed the suffering of Israel. How the Russian Cossacks ride in on their horses and abuse them, and break up their weddings and persecute them. And that's been the suffering for 2,000 years. But that's not always going to be the case because he said, I shall bring them back. Here's the restoration predicted by Moses. That day when the nation of Israel would return to the land of Canaan, Moses saw it and foretold it. And this is how he described it in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1. And it came, it shall come to pass. When God says it will come to pass, you can count on it. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, upon Israel, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations to which the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return to the Lord thy God, that the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion on thee. Did you catch that? He will turn your captivity, and he has, and have compassion on thee, and he has, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Lord thy God has scattered thee. That's God's promise. That's his covenant. He's going to do that. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul that thou mayest live. Verse 23, And they also, if they abide still not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. 
He's going to graft the Jew back into his own stock, the, the root of Israel. And then in verse 24 and 25, I'm going to have to hurry and close this. I think I'll jump down to verse 25. Would you notice verse 24? For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, that's the Jews, be grafted into their own olive tree? God's going to take those broken branches and pick them up one by one and graft them back into the tree. Not an individual Israelite, but the whole nation of Israel. Nationally, this is speaking of. And then verse 25, For I will not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, now watch this, in part, in part, does that mean all? No. In part means partially. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. And here's the next word again. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. This blindness is only until the Gentile, the last Gentile is saved. And when that last Gentile turns to Christ and is saved, then God is going to graft Israel as a nation and as a people, once again, into their own stock, into their own root, the faith of their fathers. Verse 27, verse 26, And all, so all Israel shall be saved. Verse 26, As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, who shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, that is from Israel, Israel's preservation is assured by God's covenant, by Moses' prophecy. Verse 27, For this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins. He says, when I shall. I shall is emphatic. It's for sure. Verse 28, As concerning the gospel, now we're on another track here, they are enemies for your sake. The Jew is against every, everything in the country today that's wrong. They vote wrong. They're in the wrong party. They're in the wrong political party. Everything the Jew does is wrong today. But now they're coming back out of that. As touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. That's verse 28. Concerning the gospel, today, right now, while they're still in unbelief, they are our enemies. They hate the gospel. You can't witness to a Jew very easily because they don't want, they hate you. Because they remember the persecution they endured by the Gentiles. So they hate you. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Because of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, they're beloved because of their fathers. God doesn't forget their posterity. He loves their children. Verse 29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That means God does not change His mind. He does not repent. The Bible says God is not a man that He should repent. Neither is the Son of Man that He should repent. God never repents because He never makes a mistake. He doesn't need to repent. And Paul says the gifts and the calling of God concerning Israel here are without repentance. God will never repent of His love for Israel. He'll never repent of His goodness to them. So to sum that up a little bit, in verse 25, it's only in, their, their, their chastisement is only in part in verse 25, it's only until, in verse 26, all Israel shall be saved. Verse 26 again, they will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27, my covenant will stand. Verse 27, when I take away their sins. Verse 28, the election hath obtained it. Verse 29, the calling of God is without repentance, irreversible, 
immutable, eternal, is the God we serve. He never gives up. Then I have to hurry close with this. For if they confess their iniquity, the iniquity of their fathers, with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. And yet for all that, verse 44 of Leviticus 26, Yet for all that, when they be not in the land, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. That's when they're in the land of their enemies. I will not cast them away. I neither will I abhor them. He won't hate them. To destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. God says, I won't do that. I will not do that. For I am the Lord their God. He still claims them, doesn't he? I am the Lord their God. While they're in the other countries, beaten down and persecuted under my chastening rod, I will be the Lord their God. You can't take that away from the Bible. You can't take that away from the Jew. You can't change God's mind. I will be their God. Even when they are in disbelief, He's still their God. He claims it. Verse 30. I better back up. Verse 45. But I will, for their sakes, remember the covenant of their ancestors when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. 